Thank you, guys. That's good. I am in love with my husband. It, you know, I, I appreciate the, the, the way that he champions me and he reminds me who I am. And when I forget who I am, he grabs me by the shoulders and, Jennifer, come on, you can do this. You're more than that. And so I love him. I, I stand before you as a woman in love and I'm honored to be Dwayne's wife and to partner with him and walk side by side. He's an incredible man. And we have three children. Yeah, he's, he's, he deserves that. Let's give him a clap. We have three children. Our oldest is Sydney, and she's 20. Our middle is Chloe, she's 17. And our youngest is Elijah, he's 14. Now, Elijah is pure fire. And we, we should have known, right? When we named him Elijah, we should have known. And so we've had a lot of fun as a family. We have needed each other in Brazil. We have bonded together. We have cried together. We've laughed together. We have felt like we were crazy people, but we've done it together. And so when we moved to Brazil, we, we talked to our children and we said, we don't want just mom and dad to move and then we're dragging you and uprooting your lives. We want you to pray. We want you to hear from God and then let's have a discussion as a family about this. And I, I'm just blown away by my children, the way that they have pressed into the Lord and, and in that season, they all ask God, okay, what, what's in your heart for us? They heard from the Lord, they moved to Brazil with conviction, and we have seen them prosper. Now, it has not been easy. I can't get a book to agree with what we've done. There's no psychologist that says, hey, uproot your children in their teenage years, transplant them in another nation. That book does not exist. And so I, I read all those books. I had the fear of the Lord and, and terror in my eyes, like, am I going to ruin my children? Ah! And so I've seen a lot of ministers' children get thrashed as mom and dad have done the stuff of the ministry and the kids have, have been you know, negative fruit along on the, on the road. And, and so we didn't want that to happen. And so I can, I can tell you that God has been intimately involved with us as a family. We're not perfect, we're making a ton of mistakes, but also we, we experience the grace of God. And so that is just amazing. I love to do this as a family. And so we are in love with Wes and Amanda Martin. Oh my goodness, you guys got the best when they came here. So that's exciting. We, we knew Wes when he was 21 years old. So before he was married to Amanda, he was in our home group in Kansas City and he was pure fire. You think he's fiery now, you should have seen him when it was coupled with youthful zeal. And just to, the things that would come out of his mouth, he could walk in a room and motivate every single person to go and give their lives away for the gospel. And so it's, it's just fun to see the progression of Wes's life and Amanda's life, to see that character that's been produced, but that fire is still there. And so he introduced us to, to this amazing church. And we've had the benefit of getting to know Ron and Debbie and just cannot believe the type of leaders they are, the humility that they walk in, the way that they love, the tenderness, the, the authenticity in which they relate to people and love Jesus. You guys are blessed. This is amazing, really. So this is good. So today I'm gonna talk to you from the life of Joseph. Now, I remember when I first became a believer, I was filled with youthful zeal. I had huge dreams, huge desires. I was going to take the nations single-handedly. Books were going to be written about me. It was all about me and what I would do for the Lord. And I, I started out strong and full of zeal and energy. It had big dreams and big plans. And then I ran into myself. I got disillusioned in the process. You get a little bit mistreated along this journey called life. I'm not alone in this. We have all experienced that. And sometimes you, you forget that God is in the middle of your story, that God is in the process of some of the difficulty. And so when I, I remember when I was younger, and I'm like, how do you know how to fall in love? And, and people would say things to me like, oh, you'll just know. Really? 
I did not just know. I wrestled, and, and if I had a question about Dwayne, then I'm like, oh no, maybe he's not the one because I didn't just know. I have never experienced that super easy, smooth path. I, I never had an angel come, sit before me, tell me, marry that man of God and life will be perfect. I did not have that experience. Every major decision I wrestled with and, and had a journey. And, and then I remember people would say to me, when I had children and, and I'm, you know, I'm covered with throw up. I smell like a sour cloth. You know, I've got food on my thigh because children use you as a human napkin. And, and you don't shower every day, but you sure need to. And, and you're not getting enough sleep and you're just disoriented and overwhelmed and shocked. And oh my goodness, how have I been reduced to this? And I can't even think clearly. And, and you need caffeine in all forms. And so, and, and then people would come up and say, isn't this the greatest joy of your life? I'm like, really? This is the greatest joy of my life? Now, I love my children, and I love my husband, but the journey of something being the greatest journey of my life looks messy. It's ugly. It's real. It's not romantic. And so ministry has been that as well. It's, it, you know, I could talk in broad strokes about all that I've done and who I've met and the people I've led to the Lord and, and incredible things and miracles and da, da 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 But reality is I sometimes have a hard time getting up. I'm tired. And all of that is in spite of me. I used to think it was going to be because of me, and now I know it is not because of me. I have seen my weakness. I've seen my brokenness. And anything that I'm doing that's good, I know now, as a 48-year-old woman, I know it is because of God, not because of Jennifer Roberts. And so when I read the story of Joseph, I, I relate to it. It's messy. And God writes stories, and he writes stories with your lives. And you look back, and you see the details, and you see how he can pull things together. But sometimes you don't know what he's writing. And here's the best part. You're the pen. God has his hand, and he picks you up, turns you upside down. The tip of your head is the pen. He's writing the story with you. You're upside down. He's dotting eyes. You don't know way, which way is up. You're disillusioned. You're disoriented. You can't tell which direction you're going. But he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. He knows how to write a good story with your life. He knows how to bring all the elements of a good story together. You need some conflict. You need some characters. There needs to be some testing. There needs to be trial, mistreatment, difficulty. It needs to look like there's no way forward. That's the kind of story that the Lord writes with each one of us. Because then he comes in, he's the hero, he saves the day, and he gets glory from using people like us. Isn't that good news? I love that. That's good news to me. And so I'm sitting, I'm standing here and I'm looking around and I'm, I'm wondering what's your story? What's your journey been? What have you gone through? What promises are you holding on to? And I wanna say today, you're not a fool for still believing. You're not a fool. Some of you have contended for years. The Lord spoke to you in your youth and you're still contending. What if today is the day of the fulfillment of promise? What if today is the day God breaks in and answers those things he spoke to you 25 years ago, 50 years ago? What if this week that family member that you've been contending for actually gives their heart to Jesus? I want to remind you, believe again. Wake up to the fact that you can't fulfill promises, but God fulfills promises. God fulfills promises. It says this, he's not a man that he should lie. He does not speak and then not act. He does not make a promise and not fulfill it. 
This is the God that's in your life. This is the God that's intimately aware of all of the details of your mundane life, and he loves it. And he brings it all together, and it becomes a beautiful journey. So let, let's look at, at Genesis 37. Genesis 37, 1 through 11, you know, I'm just gonna kind of paraphrase some of this passage for you. There's so much in the story of Joseph, I can't get to it all. I just wanna whet your appetite and cause you to go on a journey and study this thing out. But it's interesting, it says that Joseph was 17 years old. Okay, so 17 years old, he's, he's out in the field and he brings back a bad report. What do we know about Joseph? He's a tattletale. I try to teach my kids not to be a tattletale. Joseph goes out to the field, comes back, Daddy, they're not good workers. Daddy, Reuben pulled my hair. I mean, whatever. He comes back and gives a bad report. And then it says that his father loved him. His brothers hated him. Ooh, that's not very fun. And so, you know, as I read through this story, so many times I see myself as different characters in the story, depending on where I am in my own journey. I've been the one that's hated the one that everyone else loves. I have been that person. I've been jealous of the person with favor. I know what that feels like, and then I know what it feels like to have people hate you just because someone likes you. Ah! We're all gonna have those experiences in our life. So Joseph, 17 years old, his father loves him, his brothers hate him, that's not good. And then it says, his father loved him because, it says, he was the son of his old age. So Jacob loves Joseph because Joseph reminds Jacob that he's a man. Look at what I can do in my old age. I can produce offspring. Dun, dun, dun. I mean, the beating of the chest. I am Joseph, hear me roar. So he's seeing, or not Joseph, I'm Jacob, hear me roar. So he's seeing this, this son run around, and he knows he shouldn't have been able to produce that. He's an old man. So Joseph reminded Jacob of his strength, of his youthfulness. He felt powerful because he was able to produce a son in his old age. His brothers see all this. They hate it. They're jealous. They're envious. Now, I don't think we, we should be taking parenting about advice from Jacob, okay? Now, he's awesome. God used him, did great things. But you don't tell your son he's your favorite when you have a bunch of other children. Now, I have found categories by which I can tell my children they're my favorite. I say to my daughter, Sydney, you are my favorite oldest girl. Easy, right? And it's true. She's my favorite oldest daughter. And then I tell Chloe, you're my favorite middle child. You're the best. There's no middle child better than you. You're my favorite middle child. And then because I only have one son, I can say to Elijah, you're my favorite boy in the whole wide world. I love you more than any other boy. But I don't say to Sydney, why can't you be more like Chloe? I don't, I don't say to Elijah, why can't you be more like Sydney? You learn to love them in their own right, in their own way. And as a parent, you know you gotta be equal with this love, right? This is parenting 101. You don't say I like this one and I don't like that one. Not good. Not good for family dynamics. You get the brothers all mad about that. They're fighting, they're hating each other. So these boys are so jealous of their younger brother that they, they, they conspire, they come up with a plan. Because here's what, here's what Joseph does. He's 17 and he has a dream. Okay, I'm not gonna go into all the details of the dream. But basically the dream is one day everyone's gonna bow at his feet. Imagine saying that as a 17-year-old to your brothers who already hate you. Arrogant. You know, the, have you ever done things like that? You're, you're youthful, you're zealous, you're excited about what God has spoken to you about your future, and you tell everyone, 
I am going to be the most anointed preacher in the whole entire world. Mm. Now, we all have that season of youthful zeal. I love youthful zeal. I don't want to burst the bubble in anyone's life. But I, I want to tell you, youthful zeal runs out. Even the youth grow tired and weary, but those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. We all need a story that can't be produced with youthful energy. We all need a story bigger than ourselves that we can't make happen. But here, here's also the wisdom of God. He gives us those dreams when we're young, when we'll believe them because we haven't had any difficulty yet. We don't know there's obstacles. We don't know about betrayal. We don't know about all the things that we're gonna face. We don't have enough life experience. And the Lord goes, awesome, they're gonna believe. So he gives you a dream. He gives you a desire. He tells you something that you'll never be able to accomplish in and of yourself, so you believe it. And then what does he do? He walks you through the fire for 50 years until the arrogance gets burned off until humility gets produced in you, until you get sanctified on this journey called life, until you've experienced a little betrayal and difficulty so that you're left going, I can do nothing in and of myself, and that's when the Lord comes and fulfills the promise. That's when the Lord comes. So I'm looking at a room of people and I'm going, what if it's harvest time? Come on. How many of you have already been through the fire? I know you have. I see some gray hair out there. I cover mine up, but I see some of yours. You have lived long enough to know that life isn't fair. You have lived long enough to know that there is mistreatment, that there's betrayal, there's difficulty, there are obstacles that you can't overcome in and of yourself, and now this is when you become ready. This is when you get counted worthy of that calling. Because if it comes too soon, you'll get crushed by favor. We need to walk through a fire. We need to walk through a trial. We need to be refined like pure gold. And that takes time. That takes time. So I'm looking at a group of people and I'm thinking, it's time for a harvest. It's time for fulfillment of promises. But here's the problem. You get older and life deals some unfair blows. You taste some difficulty, some challenge. You don't have people in your corner believing that you even heard the right thing from God anyway. And you grow weary in doing good and forget the dreams of your youth. God wants to awaken the dreams of your youth because he wants to answer them today. What if today was the day that he breaks in with power? What if today was the day that that thing he spoke to you in your youth, he answers, it's time. It's time to believe again. It's time to contend again. It's time to rise up and lay hold of that which Christ Jesus laid a hold of you for. There's more and your future is bright. Your best days are not ahead or behind. Your best days are ahead. No, 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 I'm serious. It's not too late. The world may tell you it's too late. It's not too late. God is right on time and I believe many of you, even this week, are going to experience a breakthrough. Amen? Why not? Why not? So Joseph, he, he has to go out. He, so he has a dream. He's arrogant, shares the dream. Brothers hate him even more. And then his, his, his brothers go out to the field. So now Joseph isn't even working in the field anymore. He first goes out, gives a bad report, comes back, and you know goes and works, gives a bad report. His father makes him a fancy tunic, we all know about the coat of many colors, that's mean. He gives one brother this gorgeous tunic and then the others have to watch him wear it. You know, I was reading about this tunic and it says that it often, these kinds of tunics were floor length. 
So he's like, he's got a man's ball gown on, right? So floating, floating, Joseph, look at me. I am the king of the world. And it, it says that his father sent, them, sent him out to check on his brothers. So now he's not even working with them in the field. So he, he's arrogant, a little bit lazy. He's daddy's boy. He's got his fancy tunic on, and he bursts out into the field in something you don't leave the house in. I didn't, I didn't wear my wedding dress around to the grocery store. You just don't do that. I don't go outside with a prom dress and drag it along, you know, the, the yard and pick up the loose leaves. You don't wear certain things outside. You don't wear stiletto heels in the yard unless you want to do little divoting everywhere. And so it was unnecessary for Joseph to wear this coat. There's work clothes, there's play clothes, and then there's clothes that draw attention to yourself. And that was what his coat was. That coat was a sign of favor. It showed that he had favor with his father. So it says that when he was a long ways off, so he's going out to the field now, and when he was a long ways off, it said that his brothers see him. So this is in Genesis 37, 18 through 25 in that section. So you'll just have to look for yourself. It says, now they saw him afar off, even before he came near. So I'm wondering, can, can he see them or can they only see him? In the distance, there's this bright technicolored coat the brothers coming to the field. And so they begin to conspire. They decide, let's kill him. Let's get rid of the object of father's passion and maybe we have a chance of getting some attention too. So they, they decide they're gonna kill him. And they're gonna dip his coat in blood and they're gonna, you know, in his own blood and take it back to his father. But Reuben is smart in the whole process and he's like, no, let's not kill him. Let's just, you know, put him, in the pit or whatever. So it says they cast him into the pit. Now, I read up, this pit is about 30 feet deep. It says there's no water in the pit. So it's, he's in a dry and, and deserted land. It's, it's hard there, it's hot. I mean, I've, I've been to Israel, it's just like, ah. went hiking one day and it was hot and dry and I just wanted water so badly. So. He's in a pit, there's no water there. So now you read it and it says they cast him into the pit, but here's the deal. You read it so quickly that you don't really imagine how it really was like. Now it's not like they said, okay, Joseph, we're gonna lower you down, bend your knees so it doesn't hurt when you land. And when you do land, roll, roll through it, little brother. It wasn't like that. They threw him into the pit, 30 feet down. That would have hurt, right? Yeah, ouch. And then it says the next verse, and they sat down and ate. What? Bunch of jerks. Throw your brother into a pit and then sit down and have a meal? What, did they work up a sweat abusing their brother and then now they're all hungry? You call that working out, throwing your brother into a pit? Need you protein fix? So it's crazy, it's crazy. And I imagine, what was it like for Joseph? He wore that coat with pride. He wore that coat, it was a sign of favor. It set him apart and in a moment, favor is stripped off of him. In a moment, everything about his life changes instantly. We all have those times in our life where suddenly we're disrupted. Suddenly favor is removed. And when that favor is removed, you realize that you got your identity from it. Take it away, you don't know who you are anymore. Take favor of men away and you feel uncovered, you feel exposed, you feel naked, you feel humiliated, you feel mocked. That's what he went through. I believe on our journey, we will have seasons where favor is suddenly removed. Suddenly we're stripped of that thing that set us apart from someone else. 
And in that process, that's when the Lord has an opportunity to go deep inside of our inner man. When he tells us who we are, that we're bigger than what other people see, we're bigger than the praise of man, that Christ inside of us is our hope of glory. Is our hope of glory. So Joseph's in the pit now. And I'm like, what was that like? He's crying out. What did it feel like to be in the pit? You're crying out, your voice is echoing off the walls of the pit, piercing your own ears. No one's hearing him. No one's rescuing him. No one's helping him. Crying out, throat, throat is sore, it's, a, it's desert, there's no water. He's, help me brothers, help me, someone, someone, someone. No one, no one. Do you know what that feels like? to be alone, to be destitute, all your hope is gone, that's when the Lord comes. The Lord was with him even there. He's with you in your life. What's your pit experience? Was he there? I know he was. He's there. He knows how to lead you. He knows how to write a good story. And then we know that he, so he's stripped of favor, and then they get a good idea. Let's not just kill him, let's sell him. Yeah, let's sell him, sell him into slavery. Now, here's what's interesting to me. They sell him because they see a company of Ishmaelites coming and they, they sell him and they sell him for uh, 20 shekels, okay? So I, 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 I Googled, which Google is one of my really good friends, and so I Googled, and it, it said that they, the going rate for a slave was 30 shekels. So they sold him for 20. They don't even care about the money. It was just get him out of here. Whatever. Make this go away. Have you ever been treated like that? Someone washes their hands of you, sells you, humiliates you, strips you of favor. That's what Joseph went through. So he's stripped of favor, he's sold into slavery, he ends up in Egypt. So I, I, love, I love God's ways. I love God's ways. He knows how to lead us, he knows what to do. And so Joseph ends up in Egypt, and he is, uh, jo uh, uh, Genesis 39, one. So he'd been taken to Egypt, and and he is in Potiphar's house. He ends up as the number two guy in all of the Middle East. Crazy story, right? So he's there, so he, he goes from a pit to slavery, finds favor, ends up in, in Potiphar's house. He's the number two guy. It says that, that favor was with him and everything he did prospered even in Potiphar's house. The Lord was with him. The Lord was with him when he was 17. The Lord is with him in the pit. And now the Lord is with him in a season of favor again. God knows how to lead us. He knows how to lead us. So he's in, he's in Potiphar's house. Everything's going well. When suddenly it says that Potiphar's wife, in verse 7, cast longing eyes upon him. That's like romantic language for she was lusting over the boy in the house. It says he was handsome in form and appearance and Potiphar's wife wanted him, wanted him. She's not used to being denied anything she wants. She wants him. He resists her violently, no, no, no. And he flees, he fled temptation. I think he honestly would have been tempted, of course. You got a woman pursuing you heavily, the right thing to do, run the other direction. Don't stop and think about it. And no one would have known if he had engaged with her. But he ran the other direction, he fled temptation. In the process, she grabs a hold of his cloak and, and you know, he strips him of his cloak again he runs outside, she screams, the men of the house come inside, and there she is holding it, saying the Hebrew tried to make a mockery of us and tried to take advantage of me. She's a liar. She's a liar. So what happens next? 
Joseph goes from favor again to prison. It's not just a pit now, it's prison. He's in prison. And it says, the Lord was with him in prison. When you're in prison, you want the Lord to be with you. So Genesis 39, 21 through 23 talks about this. You know, the very thing that Joseph fought against he said no to this woman, and he's in prison for false accusation, so he's in prison for attempted rape. That's humiliating. He said no to that, and that's the very thing he's accused of. You know, some of you had a business deal. You had a business partner, and they messed you over. They lied about you, they stole from you, they mistreated you, they slandered your reputation. The very thing you fought for to be upright, they said the opposite about you. That's painful, that's painful. But Joseph stayed steady. So it says, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in prison. So Joseph becomes the king of the prison. And so crazy, this is how God does your journey, right? I, when I was a new believer, I thought my life was gonna go like this. Bigger, better, new, improved, 33% more free going on up. Right? Nope. This is how God leads us. Anyone else relate to that? Or am I the only one that looks like I need some stabilizing medication? I mean, really? This is how God treats his friends. David's life looked like this. Daniel's life looked like this. Joseph's life looked like this. Your life is going to look like this, but God knows how to get glory from your story. He has a plan. He has a plan for each of you. Each of you in this room, he has a plan. Often we're in the middle of transition. The chapter is turning and we're turning. He's writing a story, he's dotted the I, now he's erased something, you're in the middle of the page, he's turning the page and you don't know which way is up. God knows, God knows. And he has a plan. And I wanna remind you today, God has a plan for your life. Most of us will not go through what Joseph went to to the extreme that he went through it. But we're gonna go through it to a measure and God has a plan. We know the story. He interprets dreams in prison. And so he, he interprets the cupbearer's dream and he's gonna be restored and he goes back to Pharaoh. And as, as the cupbearer's going up to Pharaoh, he says to him, remember me. Now, if I were Joseph, I would think, tomorrow I'm getting out of prison. Na, 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 na. No. And then, you, uh, you know, I would imagine I'd go, okay, seven more days, that's it. Just takes time, just takes time, seven days. Seven days passes, no, probably six months. Six month mark, no. I mean, there's a measure of hope as he see the cupbearer leave prison knowing he has direct access to Pharaoh. You think, I mean, maybe I'm the only one, but you think I am getting out of this place and it's happening soon, but it doesn't. Two more years he's in prison. Two more years. How many of you know that that hope, ooh, disappointment. But when you taste hope and then you taste disappointment, sometimes we're tempted to draw a conclusion it'll never change. This is how it's gonna be. I'm foolish to believe. I wanna challenge that thinking today. I wanna challenge that thinking today. God broke in, and, and I'm gonna give the rest of the story. He gets out of, he gets out of prison because Pharaoh has a dream. He interprets Pharaoh's dream, and Pharaoh's dream says there's gonna be seven years of lots and seven years of plenty, so store things up. Joseph ends up being the number two man in all of the Middle East. Crazy. His brothers end up coming to him. They
they bow down before him. We know the story. God loves a good story. God loves a good story. He refines us in the process. He gives us enough hope to keep believing, to keep contending, to keep pressing in. And Joseph stayed steady. He ends up being a very, very different man than who he was at, when he was 17. By the time he see the, he's, he's elevated in Pharaoh's court, it's about 13 to 15 years. That's a long time. And then it's another few years before he sees his family again. I'm just gonna cut to the very end just super quickly. You know, one thing I, I love about this story is you would think Joseph would be bitter when his brothers come before him. They don't recognize him. They're speaking in their language. He's learned another language, so he communicates with them through a, an interpreter. They don't know it's Joseph. And then it comes time for him to reveal himself to them. And it says he could not retain himself any longer, restrain himself, excuse me. He wanted to show them it's me, your brother Joseph. You would think he would want to cut their heads off and throw them in prison and teach them a lesson and show them what it feels like. But he didn't. Obviously, God had brought, brought him through a refining process. And this is what he says to them, please come near me. It's Genesis 45, one through eight. And he says, do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. He's telling, he's comforting them because wouldn't you be shocked if you were the brothers? Wouldn't you be going, oh my goodness, I have blown it. I have blown it. And Joseph has the power to strike him down if he wants, but instead he says, don't be angry with yourselves because I see the big picture. I see that it was actually God that used you to bring me here and now I can save your lives and the lives of my people. This is amazing. God brings a story together full circle, produces in you on the journey forgiveness, humility, meekness, fortitude, resilience, and in the end, God gets the glory for what he produces in your story. This is good news. So I just want, let's just stand together for a minute. I'm excited when I look out over this crowd. I'm excited because I see some seasoned saints. I, I see gold in this room. This is a treasure chest of the ways of God. This is in this place. I'm not looking back at the youth department. I love youth. I'm looking at saints that have walked through the fire. I see gold right here. And what if today's the day of the beginning of a new season where fulfillment of promises rains down like water? What if? What if this is the day that God changes your season in a moment? He is able, he's mighty, he can do more than you ask, more than you think, or more than you can even imagine. This is your God. This is your God. 